Okay. We're on right now. Okay. Hi. Well, we'll make this the beginning. Whatever we got in the beginning of the beginning will be something else. Now, this is the <laughs> beginning of episode 24 of Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Uh, we've, we're going to go deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole this week, uh, even into a little bit of physical mutilation that she, she mentioned earlier. This should be really exciting. First of all, I want to mention the fact that we're really trying hard to keep consistently doing these programs. Uh, since you know, Google uh, decided that I was no longer responsible enough to be able to use their Hangout platform any longer. Uh, we've been on Ramola D's. And if you haven't subscribed to Ramola, D, Ramola D's channel, please do that now because we might be here for a while. And uh, she's also doing a lot of great work, great interviews and things. So it's worthwhile subscribing. But anyway, they're going to chase us around the internet. Um, personally, I'm going to try to get out of my association with Google altogether. I'm going to go from YouTube to another tube. I'm going to try and change my emails. Personally, I'm going to try to get out of because I think that's real. That I think that's very important to uh, to not. I mean, if they want to destroy their own platform, let's let them do it, and and uh, we'll go somewhere where we're more wanted and more valued. I don't know where that is. I'll tell you next week. Okay. Well, anyway, that's my announcement. Oh, by the way, uh, Mindy has come back. And as soon as she's recovered from her trip, she's going to be working on the portal. So we'll be posting a lot of this stuff on Pinecone Utopia Portal. Uh, and uh, don't forget, we're still there and we're still on Sunday nights uh, answering questions about the portal. Okay, well, anyway, now on to the real meat of the issue. Sure. Go ahead, Karen. Well, someone said something called V2. Also, D2. We're going to look at them both. Sorry to interject, people. Very briefly, I can hear the playback of, um, of the Techno Crime Fighters Forum from someone's microphone. Tell me mine. I think it's, it's probably your microphone, Paul. I can hear the background. Yeah. Um, oh, I was saying I'd heard something about that fixed it. V V two. Yeah, I think I think that's worth uh, pursuing. V two D two and see what else. I noticed that on YouTube in my subscriptions, I don't. It's hard to get now. The people that I rely on to dig these things up have stopped doing it or they've stopped doing it on YouTube. So it's hard to get information now. I'm going to have to dive deeper just to get information alone and give it. Okay. Catherine, do you want to start telling us about uh, some deceptions that you've been, they've been playing on you this week? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's really a lot, um, a lot to report. Um, I, I think today we're getting a lot of feedback. Could people maybe mute their microphones? Um, Karen, could you just mute your microphone? Um, because Karen, Karen, Karen. Karen, are you all right? It sounds like you uh, fell. She it, yes, she must be around, but she just is probably fumbling with headphones or something. Just hold on a minute. Yeah. Because that happens to me. I need headphones all the time. Um, I'll turn it to the video to the Ramola, I think. You can Sorry? Video. Yes, uh, you can put controls on the left-hand side, I think. So today, Ramola is hosting, um, and this is um, we have been sabotaged absolutely to bits by all me uh, methods. And what the intelligence agencies do sometimes is that they amplify background noise, you know. So just what we're experiencing now is actual sabotage. Um, Karen, can you hear me now? Karen? Oh, okay. Okay, I think... I th okay, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Could you just mute your microphone because we just heard the background noise? 
um, just very, very loud. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so basically, I have um, also weekly meetings with Melanie, and um, every single time, the sort of noise, distortion, and sabotage we get just gets ever more creative. It's um, it's absolutely unbelievable. But anyway, so this is the the weekly fun we have with the, in the with the intelligence agencies. Um, there are some massive, big news to report. I mean, not super big. I think the super big news are coming next week, but. Um, so I've got some quick updates to um, to make, and that's something I forgot to mention last time. So last time I've just flown back. I was um, visiting family in Transylvania, that's in, in Romania these days, and um, there's some news to report which is, um, I think, relevant for the investigation because I have been attacked on the airplane flying out to Romania and flying back, and a lot of people have this, basically. So um, that's nothing unusual so far. But um, what it also showed, and also what, what then followed is that I was stalked quite heavily in Romania, very, very um, ostentatiously. But also I was attacked with directed energy weapons. Um, in the car drive, um, when my family drove me, um, I was shot in the face from all coming cars. I was also shot into the back of the head from cars behind us. So it was exactly the same routine that I experienced now in Germany, in Switzerland, in the UK, in France, um, in Belgium. It's the same. And I can confirm that Romania is also part of this. Um, it's not a surprise because we do know that it's a global system, but every single time they attack somebody or you experience stalking, it, it, um, it's part of the evidence because in front of a court we can show that this is a global program. So all intelligence agencies are involved. Um, so certainly Romania is involved. That's not a surprise because I think Romania has been armed to the teeth because it, I think it's due to figure in the whole, you know, um, West, West versus East sort of big Star Wars, you know, Third World War thing that they're trying to stage. So that nonsense. So I know from um, local news reports that my family told me about that Romania is being armed like nothing else. So it's like a NATO weapons dump at the moment. Um, so they for sure will have electromagnetic weapons. But what is quite novel is that a German citizen is assaulted on, an, on a flight. I actually flew from Germany to Romania. So I was assaulted flying from um, you know, uh, an airport near Munich to Romania. Um, so this means that the German intelligence agencies, they are still in charge of a flight that takes off from Germany where I'm you know, still assaulted in German airspace on a German, you know, a machine that took off from Germany. Um, and also, I was shot in the face driving on the motorway from Zurich to Germany. So, um, even though we all know that this is a global program, um, I want other victims also to think in terms of jurisdictions and actually start cataloging in all the different jur jurisdictions where you were attacked. So, we know that people are attacked across all states of the US, but across Europe, we've got stronger um, boundaries. And I have, you know, I have said the intelligence agency have intelligence agencies have morphed a long time ago into one global crime cartel but you know I still have to prove that in court um, and the way to prove it is to actually show that victims are attacked in different countries so this means that um, the intelligence agencies the local stalking the, the human intelligence network of the country has been recruited for my assault and so on so the more victims um, victim testimonies we collect, the more we can map out all the different intelligence agencies and prove that they are part of this global um, crime spree. So that was very useful. Um, that was the, um, the trip to Romania. Also, what was very interesting is that I noticed, so um, I, I have now proven to people that I've got these head chips on my head and they are sometimes set off to cause headaches, you know, and I think depending on, it's like it called the body area network. It also interfaces with chips elsewhere on my body. But I noticed that if they want to induce a very quick headache, what they will do is that they will um, activate the chips on my forehead and it will literally feel like a current flowing through my forehead because it's probably a networked um, chip network on my forehead. And it will start literally crawling and, and burning but it's like an um like like a current feeling really and then within minutes i have got the most agonizing it's it's not even a migraine it's like a headache that once it establishes itself it can somehow be moved around you, you know my head it's like a crawling headache that can switch from left to right back and front so i think they're doing this with the um chips on on the head but i was assaulted on the airplane again by burning to the back of my head 
So that came from the seat behind me. Again, the people in the seat behind me were young people, early 20s, the entire row, young people. So these are trainee agents. And again, I was microwaved in the head. But then I think I was shot from the overhead lockers. And I always thought that the bottom of the overhead lockers is metal because it has to hold these, um, you know, the, um, the bags. But I actually suspect that it's just plastic. It's just hard case plastic because you can see it bend, you know, if, if someone puts on a heavy bag. So this means if anyone puts a microwave weapon in the overhead locker above you, then you can be shot straight down into your head. And that's what I felt. At first, I thought, oh, they just set off my, um, the chips on the top of my head from the overhead locker. But when I put my hand on the top of my head, I could feel that the knuckles were aching. In other words, they were shooting through my knuckles. Um, so it's kind of bad. But um, you know, if somebody wants to shoot into your brain, they have to shoot through your skull. So it has to be a frequency that can shoot through. And then when you put a hand in the way, what you will feel is that you've got thick um, uh, bones with a layer of nerves on top, I think. And then when the energy gets absorbed by the dense material, it can make, you know, your knuckles ache. It sets off the nerves, I think. I think this is how it works. So I was attacked from the overhead lockers. Um, and then in Romania, they, they didn't hit straight into my body. So here in, um, in Switzerland, um, my home in Zurich has been entirely surrounded by, by electromagnetic machine guns. And I, I say that now in greatest detail because I think a lot of other victims have this as well. So if you have flashes of joint ache or you feel, for example, your popping sounds inside your stomach or inside your head, this means it's some sort of cavitation effect and somebody shot into you, probably from close range, which means um, neighboring buildings in my experience. And you can try that by just um, putting metal above your head and see if somebody can still shoot at you from the side. And if you see, feel these flashing pains, most likely it's an electromagnetic pulse. And on my um, channel, I actually demonstrated what it looks like when such a, an electromagnetic pulse from a, an electromagnetic machine gun um, is shot into metal foil. It actually puts a dent into foil. It's that intense. But if it if it's, um, hits your body, that's when you suddenly feel intense heartache because your heart gets like a, a knock or you feel just intense pain inside or on your temples, on your forehead, in your face. Um, th these are all these electromagnetic shots. Um, so here at home, I literally have to bunker myself in when I'm working at my desk. And when I go to bed, I have to bunker down and I can hear the shots all throughout the night. Um, that's Zurich people, that's, you know, concentration camp Zurich. But in Romania, they couldn't hit me directly. And I think maybe the neighbors are not as involved or they didn't allow weapons to be put down or the, the building walls are still very old fashioned and very, very thick. Um, and, um, but what they did in Romania is that they tortured me with this artificially induced headache with the head chips. And that was agonizing. And one of the things that a lot of victims, I think, notice is that the intelligence agencies try to destroy all the happy moments. So when you're with family or when you're with your children or when, you know, some, someone has a birthday or, you know, Christmas or something, these kind of joyous events, they will try to destroy them specifically to cause trauma. And that's what they did with me as well. So if you, if you experience any of these things, you have to be aware that you are in this program. It's a, sat I would say, a satanic takedown program, satanic torture program run by psychopaths and the intelligence agencies. And um, don't panic. Um, write down what happens to you. Try to spot the pattern. And also try to learn to distinguish between pain that might be induced through the chips on, that you have maybe on your head or in your body and the, the pain that's induced by direct shots. And that's very important to learn because if you're shot into, you can block it out with metal. So you can put, you know, if you know that the machine gun is placed at your neighbor's house, then you can kind of try to shield from that side. But if the pain continues, it could be either a back reflection or if it's always in the same place, you might have a covert chip. And just because you can't remember being implanted doesn't mean you don't have a chip because none of us can remember ever being implanted, you know, none of us. And, um, you know, and that's, it's now being done at hospitals, it's being done covertly. So that's the report. And that was basically the, the story about Romania. I have some more, um, you know, um, 
interesting things to report. Um, and I, I now, sorry to bother people with this in detail, but I'm saying it because I think a lot of victims will ex um, experience the same thing. And I want to teach people what to do about it. So imagine just before driving off to the airport, I dropped off evidence at my local police station here in Switzerland. And what I gave them was um, an entire report about the assaults um, into me, the, the shots I received. I gave them the video that's online, which um, shows, it's, I think it's entitled Audible Invisible Shots. And I made a, um, a second version of it where I highlight every shot in the video so people can see that. I gave that to the police. It also shows how a shot is actually denting metal, metal foil on my shoulder. Um, it's that hard. And then I gave them audio recordings, and I encourage everybody to buy an audio um, recorder, which I think it's something like thirty dollars in the U.S. and you know thirty euros here, and um, make the audio recorder such that it doesn't have Wi-Fi. Don't use your phone um, recorder because that can be manipulated through the um, um, the phone link. So buy an audio recorder that's standalone, and um, record throughout the night what's happening and try to put metal shielding around your head and around your body. Because if you're target, I suspect you'll be shot into at night and these shots can be heard, um, you know, bounce off metal. I think um, all of us, you know, um, Karen, Ramola, Melanie and I, and I think even Millicent, we hear these shots, you know, they bounce off metal. Now, when you put metal around you at night and you have an audio recorder, even when you're asleep, these shots can be heard. And when I did this exercise, I had the shock of my life because I sleep totally surrounded in shielding. I, I live on sleep in a bunker at night. Um, nevertheless, I can hear the shots um, come through gaps. Now, when I recorded throughout the night, there were phases where there was a shot, you know, barrage, like nothing else, where pro second, I received several hundred shots into me. It sounds literally like, like the drumming of you know hundred wasps hitting the shielding. Well, what this is an electromagnetic machine gun. They can fire even more pulses than a normal machine gun. Um, and I discovered that every ten to twenty minutes, my body is shot up, absolutely shot up to bits. So I made this audio recording. I also um, discovered that it seems to be the case that a drone is landing at night because I can hear the engine sound. I can see some humming. And I think Karen said that she heard something similar. And then, very interestingly, I can hear hard three hard knocks in the audio recording and the repeat of these three hard knocks over and over. And it's almost like a tripod landing on the roof. And it just goes kadunk, dunk, dunk, you know, as it just comes down. Wow, I've never heard this because they come at 3 a.m. when I'm fast asleep, you know, 4 a.m. And that's what I heard. But with these audio recorders, you can pick it up. And once you have it recorded, you can do forensics audio, um, forensic audio analysis on that, and you can pull out all sorts of stuff. So that's my recommendation for people. But imagine I'm going to the police again, and I'm giving them this pretty amazing evidence, yes, about electromagnetic attacks that you can't refute because this is an audio recording, and this is video recording. This has nothing to do with my mental state. This is actual objective evidence. So I drop it off at the police, and as always, I wrote it down, what it contains, I hand it in, I hand in a CD, I burnt all the data on the CD, and I've got a second copy, a second CD, and the, the statement um, printed off again, and I say, this is one copy for you, this is my copy, could you please stamp it, you know, um, give a, like a confirmation of receipt onto this, so that we all agree what material I handed in. And the policewoman said to me, no, I'm not going to stamp it. And I said, but why? And she says, because I don't want to. And I said, well, that's very interesting, you know, because I need this for a court case and I need to prove that I've handed this into the police, especially because, you know, some evidence wasn't recorded at your police station. So I said, look, I need this for my, my court case. I need evidence that I handed it in today, ideally with the date. And then she says, no, sorry, I'm not going to do it. And then I said, but please, I need it. I mean, I need to have some sort of evidence. And I'm arguing that with her, you know. And she says, no, I don't have to discuss with you why not. I'm just not going to do it. And then I said, but why? And she says, because I don't want to. And then she grins at me broadly. I was just shocked. And that is a certain 
Ms. Maya with M-E-Y-E-R. And I, I think she was the woman who was, um, when I called the criminal police of Canton Zurich, they passed it back to the local police and it was given to, I think it was Frau Maya. And her investigation consisted of calling my husband, who has not a clue and can't be dealing with this and doesn't want to deal with this, talking to him for 10 minutes on the phone, never calling me, never interviewing me, never asking me for evidence, doing nothing. And then putting it um, you know, away and saying, oh, we suspect she's, you know, um, she had a psychological change. Okay, very interesting. So I have again from Maya in front of me, and she now refuses to actually confirm that I hand this in. So what do you do in a situation like that? So number one is you audio tape the whole thing. You don't go into a police station without covert audio recording. So thank God I have that. I have actually um, from Maya um, refusing to stamp that. Um, and then I patiently argued with her. And then when she refused, I said, fine, OK, you don't have to stamp it. But now I would like to make another police report, and this time for police corruption. And that's when she suddenly you know, started having big eyes. And she's like, why? Just because I don't want to stamp this for you? And I said, no. It's because since um, autumn of 2015, I'm reporting harassment by the surveillance network. And since January 2016, I'm reporting microwave mutilation. And you refuse to investigate. And now, over a year on, now you even refuse to stamp my evidence. That's why. And then I, I almost missed my flight because I was just patiently, you know, uh, spelling out the details of the police corruption in my view. And she had to write it down. And at the end, I said, OK, can I please have a photocopy of what you've just written down, what goes into the file? She says, no, I'm not going to photocopy that. And I was like, bye, Jove, that's interesting. And I was like, fine, Frau Maya. No problem at all, thinking, well, I've got this one recorded for them for my files. You know, you will, you will be hearing from me again from Maya. So what you do, if anything like that happens to you again, what I did is I called the police station one village down. And then I said, hello, I've got a court case. I need to prove what evidence I handed in to the police. How do I do that? And the police officer said, well, you just get, in German, it's called Empfangsbestätigung, like a receipt of, um, you know, a, a, well, a receipt of um, that we received evidence. And I was like, oh, really? Um, do you have to write that? They're like, of course we write that. I was like, good, recording, you know, recording the phone conversation. Thank you. And I said, um, this, you know, confirmation of receipt, could that be something like a stamp on the report that I've just handed in? Like you, one photocopies it and stamps it. And he was like, yeah. Yeah, for example, that would be one for. I said, well, could I insist on having that? And he says, well, yeah, because we have to, you know, give you a, a receipt. And I was like, thank you. So this is what you do, people, if anybody, because I know that everybody has problems with the police. This is what you do. If they give you hassle, you make them report about their own police corruption. You prove that you have reported police corruption. And then you don't give up if one police station blocks you. You kind of have to flow around the corruption like water. You go to another police station, another part of town, and, and, and. So I think this is what to do. Um, so that's it. And I also figured, I also found out the people when in this police station did not want to tell me who the chief of police is in that local station or who is the police officer who deals with my case. But that, again, you can find out from their colleagues because I just asked the other you know, um, police station. And I said, by the way, do you happen to know who, um, who is leading the police station in my part of town? And they said, oh, yes, of course. It's a Mr. Wendelin Koch. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that information. So Mr. Wendelin Koch will from now on receive, you know, um, letters addressed to him personally as the chief of the local police and most likely I will be also charging him in court with police corruption because ultimately the buck stops with him so and I, I really invite absolutely everybody to do to do the same thing do not be cowed do not let yourself be fobbed off because I think the name of the game is abrasion it's time wasting and it's intimidate your way so that you don't you know what? It's they're trying to put um, a barrier between us and us using the state institutions that we're entitled to use. These are the police, the hospitals, and so on. You know, also the attorney generals, they're also a public office, you know, and the courts. They're trying to block us from our actual right of using these institutions um, of democracy. So my philosophy is 
we don't let them have these institutions, we want them back. So if they block you, you force them to give these institutions back to you. You claw away at them until we have it back. So if they are police, uh, corrupt police officers, we have to have them removed. And somebody who's slightly less corrupt can take their place, you know? So um, that's the report. And in the second half, I would like to go into um, the U UK police and the absolutely astounding corruption I've seen from them. But I, that's it for, for, for now from me. I'll tell you later when we dive down the rabbit hole, I've got much more. <laughs> but I'll pass the microphone to somebody else. And um, I think actually Ramola has a lot to um, report. Do you want to report about um, the idea you had? Because I think that's really huge. Uh, yes, absolutely, Catherine. Thanks so much for going into detail about all of your police visits and everything. Um, you know, hardly know how to pick up from there because what you've done is extraordinary. You're sort of leading the way and kind of role modeling for the rest of us. Um, to actually go to the police with our reports and present evidence. Because, you know, in the, in the email listservs and the little groups where, you know, uh, American targets in particular gather, uh, there's a lot of talk about... Oh, oh. <laughs> in other words, oh, you might like to have a psychiatrist sicked on you. Hang on, hang on, Ramona, wait, wait, wait. Because we lost you for a minute. A we lost you for a couple minutes. Yeah, oh. but the crucial now. The, yeah. Isn't that interesting? So, so what I was saying was, in our little email list of where the government infiltrators loom large and every day make their presence known, telling us what to do and what to think and how to say and what to say and so on, um, we constantly hear this nonsense about never go to the police because you're likely to be sectioned. In other words, a psychiatrist will be sick on you. Right? <laughs> Just so that, that's what I said. <laughs> Yeah, that's what you said. But guys, can you tell why she was cut off? <laughs> the NSA was like, no, <laughs> do not expose our infiltrators. <laughs> shut up. Shut oh, up. that's what it is. They're so afraid. Well, you know, they should be afraid because I am the person who does not back down. When I encounter an infiltrator, I tell everybody that's an infiltrator. You know, and as you guys know, I've done it now on a couple of our email listservs and I will keep doing it because guess what? Not only do they not listen when I ask them to let me off those stupid email lists, they keep me on there. Why? Why are they keeping me on there? I feel trapped. I feel trapped in this horrible labyrinth where these horrific infiltrators keep dashing out and saying, the U.S. government is not involved in targeting. They, in fact, do not have the means whatsoever. They have no global reach. They have no connections with other intelligence agencies. I mean, you all know what Julianne McKinney just recently wrote on that list of, right? And she in particular, although I do respect that one report labeled Julianne McKinney from a long time ago, um, we all know that the particular person hovering on our email list is a highly suspect person. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, in my opinion, a usurped ID. You know, it's very easy, I'm sure, for intelligence agencies to come along and steal IDs, right? And pretend to be somebody else. Yes, and, and you know what, that's very, I think it's very important to point out that um, we, we are, you know, or, or you and I certainly are of the opinion that the Julianne McKinney that's on the email list is not the Julianne McKinney who, who gave that interview. That was really astounding because the yeah, tone yeah. and frankly the utter rudeness of the newer day julia mckinney doesn't fit the age bracket nor the eloquence of the woman who actually gave that not at all no, not to mention catherine the compassion empathy and sympathy of the person who gave that interview so this was an interview with greg Zemansky, i think it's the one radio interview we have of julia mckinney who wrote that sort of cornerstone report about electronic surveillance, who is supposed to have been alumni of the Electronic National Surveillance Project, who's supposed to have been army intelligence person, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but a person of great, as you say, elegance, eloquence, and and, and empathy, really. But that is not the Julianne McKinney that we encounter on, on you know, our list of. So highly disappointing, but really just a heads up. And it seems to me the more we look in look at this particular email list that we're all trapped on that I most definitely appear to be trapped in, um, you know, the people whom we see as infiltrators actually keep announcing themselves because they come out and they constantly protect the government. They constantly protect the security and intelligence agencies, and they constantly caution people like us never to go to the police, never to speak out, be very careful what you say, and here are the terms in which you can say things. 
there are certain technologies you must not mention. Do not go on and on about implants. Do not go on and on about satellites. Don't mention this, that, and the other. But instead, stay on this list of and keep talking to us. Go round and round and round like a rat in a maze. And do not stand up and speak to the public. Well, you know, this is the wrong thing to tell a journalist. This is the wrong thing to tell a writer. Because obviously, I am not going to sit around and be told by anybody what to say, what to think, how to write, and you know how to present what I believe is the truth. So um, in any case, um, so you, I think, Catherine, are sort of blowing that right out of the water, that kind of real closing down on, on targets, or closing down on people who are being wrongfully assaulted by governments and by militaries. And you are sort of paving the way for kind of open public exposure and actually challenging the authorities that are already in place, you know, their authorities. So we have to challenge those authorities. We have to present our information and our evidence to those authorities. And we all know, by the way, that very often the police are actually involved. The police are very well aware of what's going on in each of our towns, right? Even if they're not involved, they're very aware. And they are, uh, this is a very permissive kind of operation. They have permitted this operation. So as you said, you mentioned drones. Now I also, just like Karen, hear drones. Now Karen, I think, is in, is in the Washington DC area and I am here up in Boston, okay? I have, from the beginning of the time that I was assaulted, I've been hearing drones. They zip up right, up, seem to come up the side of the house and, and hover right on top of the house. And very often, I'm hit immediately with microwave blast attacks from the drones because they are able, I mean, these are predator drones, right? They are able to kind of pinpoint you with precision, pinpoint your location with precision, thanks to all the brain chips, which, by the way, thanks to your a uh, bug detector device, Catherine, that you sent last week, as you know, we were on a Skype call together and I actually did find evidence of a brain chip right on top of my head. And just like you, I planned to produce a video with that little detector device in my hand to show the chips and to show how it lights up each time a chip is encountered. I think, you know what, that's so valuable. But what, what um, you know, you and I did is what Melanie did with me. And she found my chips. So we were, um, I brought my Faraday cage. Um, I've got one from Aronia, you know, it's like a big Faraday cage. And we were in her flat and um, she, I first, um, you know, I was scanning her body chips and I found them with this bug detector, which I think I might even have lying around somewhere, but it's, it's on my website. And um, it's just, well, 160 euros. It is, but it's not, you know, a um, thousand. So you can um, use fund, um, crowdfunding to raise that sort of sum. But the point is that that bug detector has the biggest frequency range from one megahertz to six gigahertz. So it should find the vast majority of body chips people have, in my view. And it seems to do that. And you know what? Um, when Melanie did the, um, the chip finding with me, so she let um, me scan her and I could see the chip on the top of her head, in her ears, you know, there were very strong signals also in her arm and so on and in, in, on, on her neck. And then she scanned me and at first, um, because this um, bug detector needs some time to hone in on the frequency because the frequency range is really broad, one has to be patient because it scans the entire um, area and at first trying to scan myself i was struggling and melanie just said look just give it give it here and i'll show you where they are and she just held it to my neck um and it just went nuts that moment and she says there you go and you've got one on the back of your head as well she held it to the back of my head and this thing went nuts again and she said by now i know where these chips are and she explained to me that she had attended several chipping sessions where there were i think um you know a handful up to a dozen of people every single time and every person was chipped and every person was chipped in the same places. And these people were coming from all across Europe and even the US. And it's very interesting because you are chipped exactly in the same places as I am. Yes, and I think Millicent and I have talked about this too. There's something when we were working on her article together, we were really focusing on the, the wireless bands, you know, the body area network. And these are connected, you know, the, the body area network information is connected to information coming out of NASA because they were really interested in telemetry and there's a lot of, you know, research projects associated with NASA. Um, so, yes, so apparently they have a program of chipping people in exactly one set of places, you know, all around the body and there's some kind of connection with wires as well. Um, so, yes, that's absolutely right and that's astonishing. And I just noticed in the chat room people wanted the link to the, to the, um, 
to the device that you were talking about, the bug, bug detection device. And yes, I think I will put it in the that. I will put it in the chat, and I want to say to people how serious this is because um, this body area network, you're kind of, it's like, um, the way to think about it is like little beacons. So your these chips are um, emitting frequencies, they're sending nonstop, so they can send biofeedback data, so um, life sign data, they can send data, but they most certainly can sell, send like a ping signal. And once you have already that, what you basically have is a map of a human body, and the computer can see you walk, can triangulate between the chips, and can find out, you know, when you have chips in all these locations, find out how to hit your heart. You know, even if, if the, um, if the uh, visuals are not good enough for the algorithm to recognize it, it for sure can pick up these markers on your body and find your heart, or find a particular location in your brain to give you an instant stroke as you're walking down the street. So this is extremely serious when a person is found with an illegal body area network. Because what it means is that the intelligence agencies you want those markers to read out your biofeedback data. And the question is, what sort of medical experiments are they running when they need your biofeedback data? And the second thing is, they need those markers to snipe at you. So that explains why we're all being sniped as we're driving our car, you know? And yes, I, and not only that, you know, the fact that, as you said, because you have these uh, chips all over your body, they, they literally act as transponders, right? In other words, they can send signals to these chips to send particular frequencies to different organs in your body or to really ramp it up. They can turn up the intensity and therefore what you experience is torture. So this is nothing but torture. This is like, a, this is um, a setup to permit torture. And I can tell you that one person, you know, I hear many stories when people write to me and people stay in touch with me and, share some of their stories with me and some of them are not ready to publicize their stories but i can tell you the story somewhat anonymously some and the person who's you know whose story it is will know but i'm going to strive to keep it anonymous for now this person actually was in surgery and she woke up in the middle of surgery and she saw and heard things that are absolutely astounding so there was one person waving around a letter saying that he had permission from the pentagon to install a five-level torture protocol, okay? So that, when you talk about wireless, when we talk about wireless body area networks and about dozens of chips implanted all over our bodies, non-consensually, completely illegally, completely criminally, I don't care if it's by the CIA for some, you know, classified national security mission or if it's, you know, by the local mafia doing this just for the pleasure of sadism and depravity. Whatever it is, it is illegal and it is criminal. And I think increasingly that's what we need to talk about, you know. So when we talk about um, wireless body area networks, we are really talking about torture protocols that somebody has okayed and somebody is permitting because these are being done in an organized fashion. If more than one human being on the planet has the same pattern of chips on their bodies, then you have to think that is a program, you know. That is a structure. Somebody set that up. Doctors were involved. Medical personnel were involved. Because who else would know the human body but medical type, right? So think about that. So it's not just Mitchell and Jessen being hauled over the coals, you know, from the CIA or right now with this, this whole story about them doing a settlement and uh, having to pay back those um, people they tortured through the CIA rendition programs. It's not just Mitchell and Jessen. I would suspect that there is an army of psychiatrists, psychologists, and medical doctors, people just familiar with the body, probably dermatologists, you know, various kinds of doctors. Think about it. Doctors of every kind working with the CIA, working with these deep black agencies to set up such torture protocols. So that actually is a good segue into talking about our new campaign, our, which is to do with giving everybody in the world, including militaries, including intelligence agencies, including security agencies, including your local police, everybody notice these are crimes against humanity. So last week, what I did was, as you know, one of the people that we all know, who's, um, well, um, whose case that I have studied, I, I, again, I should, keep, I should keep this particular story anonymous for now, one of the people that we all know has been suffering greatly 
has been assaulted in public, in her presence, with people talking in her presence about what they were doing to her. And she's been in a state of extreme torment because her implants have been activated precisely in forms of torture. And so this particular case struck me very deeply and I was trying to figure out what on earth we can do, how we can respond. Because in a sense, um, you know, we are, we are a human rights group. You know, we're not an association or an organization or anything. We're not incorporated in any way. We're just sort of a group of concerned people, right? And I think the only way we can move this forward and take action, I think, is if we um, react in useful ways, constructive ways, based on inputs that are, you know, directed toward us. So at least this is how I think. And I just thought, you know, I do, and, and you know, I, all, I think always at, at this point in time, we need to act on our hearts. We need to listen to our hearts, see where our empathy is, see where our compassion is, see how we are being impacted in our feelings and then take action from that space. You know, rather than from ego or what we're planning to do or whatever, just work from the heart. So literally, I was so upset when I uh, heard about what was going on with this person last week that I started to think, think, what can I possibly do? I looked up crimes against humanity, and guess what? I found the United Nations Genocide Prevention website. Okay, so if you just Google crimes against humanity and type United Nations, you might find that website. Um, and um, what I found was there's something called the Rome Statute. The 1998 Rome Statute is an international treaty that has helped establish the International Criminal Court. Now, I don't know to what extent any of these bodies are useful or actually doing their jobs, you know, because you would think the International Criminal Court would be a place of justice where everybody in the world could go to. I don't know if they're really working in that fashion. Let's hope they are. But the way I see it is, this is a United Nations body whose um, stated job is to take care of the world. And uh, this is um, the International Criminal Court and, and the Rome Statute. Their stated job, what they are stating for the world to hear is, um, is that they are engaged in the business of genocide prevention and their responsibility is to protect the world population. So because that is the case, I am going to take what they say to, you know, at face value. Article 7 of the Rome Statute is posted on that website, if you go look. And Article 7 lays out all of the different um, crimes against humanity, which include rape, sexual assault, um, enslavement, persecution of various kinds, etc. So I looked at that and I decided, well, what we are experiencing around the world with the assault of electronic and EMF weapon and neural weapons in our person is nothing but crimes against humanity. However, it is not being openly um, talked about. We are here and we can talk about it. So I drew up a notice again, notice of crimes against humanity and I hope to, you know, fine tune it along with um, your input, all of your input and publish it shortly. And I would like for people all around the world to hand it out to everybody. Excuse me one moment, I'll be right back. But go ahead, Catherine, perhaps you can comment on that. Um, yes, I think um, I, I think I can, and I, I think the um, the idea behind it is um, is the following. I mean, as Ramola pointed out, these are crimes against humanity, and what people need to know is that every police station in the Western world has a statutory duty to investigate crimes against humanity, and every um, intelligence agency, um, you know, um, also has the same duty. So the entire point is to really put these people on notice now officially that these crimes against humanity are being committed and um, you know um, any sort of notice like that to a police station automatically has to entail an investigation if they do not investigate if they refuse to investigate crimes against humanity they are aiding and abetting crimes and against crimes against humanity that applies to police stations to all law enforcement to intelligence agencies as well, especially to intelligence agencies who have a duty to fight terrorism. That's the whole point, right? That is the whole point. Maybe we forgot because they seem to be staging terrorist events, pseudo-terrorist events, and real ones, but that is the point. That's what they get the money for. If they use the money to um, stage terrorist events, that is high treason. Um, if they kill people um, en masse um, with terror, then that is a crime against humanity. 
And I think this is very important because you really went into it. You looked up the exact um, laws and the exact um, legal terms. And I think this is fantastic because these people need to be put formally on notice. And that is the last step before before court cases, actually. And you know what? Um, putting a notice together like that can be automatically given to any police station in the Western world, certainly. And I think in most other places as well, you know, like Australia, um, it's very likely run exactly the same way. You know, I think the entire Commonwealth. And you know, Catherine, I think it's very important to let these intelligence agencies know, to let the heads of these intelligence agencies know that they think they can get away with this because these are covert weapons. These are radiation weapons, okay? They are invisible. And that's um, how they're getting away with it. Can people, oh my goodness. 81, sorry, it was probably too, too fast. Sorry to interrupt, Ramola. You were just talking about radiation weapons. This is a Geiger counter that's on my desk. It's actually, it looks like nothing, but it's fairly expensive. But this is a professional Geiger counter. And one of the things I noticed talking about radiation weapons is that I'm being shot into by about 80 microsievert per hour. Um, you know, this is this is amazing. I mean, it's like a chest X-ray. I get chest X-rayed every every couple of minutes. You know, and I have seen that on many of our Skype conversations, Catherine. Every time you've held it up, and I have seen that eighty. I think it just flashed up momentarily before it vanished. Yeah, and you know what? It's very telling because one of the things that people don't know is that the Earth is showered by what's called cosmic radiation. So this is particles coming from outer space and the sun and all sorts. And that can contain massive amounts of energy. And those can also come through several floors of buildings. The energy is so high. But this um, signal I'm seeing is always between 80 and 90 microsievert. It looks so, you know, um, cosmic radiation is an entire spectrum. I expect to see all sorts, but I don't. I only just see between 80 and 90 exactly, which tells me this is a surveillance weapon. This is an X-ray surveillance weapon and every couple of, um, you know, every once in a while, they flash my house to figure out where I am, I suppose, you know. Sorry, I just wanted to um, show no, this. That's very good. Yeah, it's interesting that you use the word surveillance weapon together because, you know, the way they are covering all of this is by stating that they have surveillance devices. They're not weapons. They don't call them weapons, you see. They're hiding them, both in language and in reality. They're, they're getting away with being able to use it on civilian populations. But you're right, they are surveillance weapons because every time a pulse of radiation hits the human body, it is an assault on the human body. Exactly. And this is what I'd like to tell intelligence agencies, tell, security, tell the heads of security agencies, tell the heads of governments, you think you can get away with this. You think it's okay to keep these weapons hidden and undercover. You think you can hide them under national security classifications. And you think you can go lie in our neighborhoods and tell people that we are under investigation. And we need to be electronically surveilled and electronically tracked. Whereas in actuality, you have co covertly and illegally and criminally implanted us. And you are assaulting us nonstop, 24-7. You are sending pulses of radiation our way, which are hitting either our brains or our bodies. You know, in nothing but torture protocols. Those are crimes against humanity. Let's get real. That's exactly what they are. So somebody needs to stand up and tell them. This is BS, you know, this is atrocious. These are crimes against humanity and you are being monitored. You will be photographed, you will be recorded and you will stand up one day in a people's court or a people tribunal and you will account for your crimes. Absolutely, I think I think there's also a very good chance of tr um, trying these people in a real court because um, you know, to, to explain um, just very briefly as a sidetrack, once you're talking about these weapons, people have to understand there's two types of radiation. <clears throat> One of them is ionizing radiation. That's what the Geiger counter can measure. That's, you know, very high gamma, um, gamma radiation, basically punching through the otherwise known as, you know, lower um, energy as x-rays. And, um, and there's also non-ionizing radiation that can give your body still cancer, can still fry your brain. That's microwave radiation. So microwave is non-ionizing, so my Geiger counter will not show anything when I, you know, when I turn on my microwave, but um, electromagnetic um, measuring devices like this one show it exactly. So your, this device goes nuts when I turn on my microwave. That's another, you know, report for another day. Um, but when you're being surveyed, um, all of this, these types of radiation are being used. And I think what, um, what these pulses of x-rays are, that's, I think, a surveillance um, machine that actually x-rays through the wall. 
And I have seen actually screen um, shots from devices, I think, manufactured by the big arms manufacturers, which literally show people inside a building. And you can see the silhouette roughly of the, of the walls, but you can see people inside. You know, it's insane. Yes, and in fact, this morning, or rather late last night, I posted this letter that a group of um, reporting victims from Germany recently sent to the German Ministry of the Interior, you know, reporting these crimes um, with the signatures of 121 Germans and demanding that the German government do something about it, you know, and also pointing out to the German government that they had, that they had put out various reports and the reports that they had put out 10 years earlier, threats to public safety kind of reports, um, a report that was put out 10 years earlier in 2001, prior to 2011 when the next report came out, the, the, the 2001 report had actually stated that electromagnetic, electromagnetic terrorism was uh, a threat being posed by the proliferation of microwave weapons in the midst of civilian populations. You know, and then later on when they re-examined the subject, they completely left out uh, microwave weapons, the possibility of humans being assaulted, et cetera, et cetera. And they focused on uh, EMP weapons, which is nuclear uh, electromagnetic pulse weapons, and the possibility of electronic and computer systems being assaulted. So they kind of tried to take the focus away from human beings. And they totally ignored the shift of the focus. So I, um, I posted this, this, um, this letter. And, and one of the things that this letter references is a wonderful article by, by a researcher called David G. Gaia. And I posted the link to that article, which actually details the whole history of how governments, in particular the U.S. government, um, has been, you know, working with, um, going back in time, going back to those Nazi scientists who worked in concentration camps in the cow and Auschwitz and uh, experimented on people, going back in time to that time period, but also tracing the history of how all of these programs with these Nazi scientists and these Nazi programs of assaulting the human brain, eventually with electromagnetic radiation, developed and were hidden under various program headings all through time and bring us to the present day. Present day. And one of the very interesting things that that particular article talks about is that the term non-lethal weapons, which I know we've talked about quite often here, actually first surfaced in a secret document from the CIA in the 60s. Now, this is news to me, but I thought it's very, very telling because the CIA, as we all know, is in the business of mass deception in addition to mass torture undercover. So it, it really is just just hold a second from Ola, because I've just noticed another bit of sabotage. As you said, in the business of torture, one of the things I noticed is that, um, you know, the intelligence agencies are messing with Karen's microphone. And even though it is muted, if there's a very long, you know, if you're about to say something very um, pertinent, her microphone will quickly flicker on and then flicker off again. And some background noise that was there was just amplified. So on my end, I could just see her microphone muted and then it would just go on full whack when you just said that. So I could just catch bits of it. So just highlight again the sentences they wanted to censor. <laughs> oh my, well, okay, I'll just say that what? whole sentence again because you know, apparently they do want us to highlight it. So here goes. So <laughs> one of the things that really struck me <laughs> was this term non-lethal weapons, which all of us have talked about so often and which, you know, is rather an unusual term, but now we have the joint non-lethal weapons directorate. Everything, you know, electromagnetic weapons and high-powered microwave weapons, which are being used in humans, are being hidden under this massively comforting, seemingly comforting title, non-lethal weapons. So two of the things that the, that the army will try very hard in the documents to tell you about non-lethal weapons is, one, they're non-lethal, they're not going to kill you. And two, the effects are reversible. Yeah, cancer is reversible, no doubt. So, <laughs> so non-lethal, as you know, is all of us, anybody who's slightly educated can look at that term and laugh our heads off at how ridiculous it is. But the thing that emerges from this particular article that I thought was very interesting was that the term non-lethal weapon apparently first surfaced from secret documents from the CIA in the 60s, the 1960s, which really tells you, which is very telling, because basically what it tells you is that, the, well, we all know the CIA is in the business of mass deception, just as much as it is in the business of mass torture, right? Torture undercover. So... 
it's very interesting that the term non-lethal actually did not come from the army, did not come from the military. Although now they work hand in hand, of course. It actually came from the CIA. And the CIA, as we know, works with language, works with language in order to obfuscate, in order to cover over, in order to keep hidden. So it's very, very interesting that that term comes from the CIA, from a CIA document. And I don't know which document it was or whatever. I don't think he actually linked to a document. But it makes me think that's something I'd like to research to find out more about, you know, where exactly does it come from? Because MK Ultra and all of those mind control programs have gone underground since the 70s and have entered the realm of DARPA, have entered the realm of the DOD, have entered the realm of the US Navy. So now they're all working together on mind control, which is nothing but neurotech, right? Neurotechnologies, behavior modification technologies, mind control technology. And, and now it's all off of peace. It's almost as if what the CIA did that surfaced briefly through the church committee that everybody came down on them for, suddenly has been normalized has entered the realms of all these other agencies and departments and now appears to be perfectly okay by them. They just still want to keep it secret. They still want to cover it under sources and methods of gathering intelligence, classified in the interests of national security, above top secret, etc. So one thing that this German letter that I posted this morning, and if anyone wants to go to my webpage, you can read both my article as well as uh, my article reporting the letter and uh, the, the letter itself, the whole text of the letter beneath it. One thing that this letter does pretty brilliantly is to point out that there is so much secrecy surrounding the use of these weapons on populations worldwide that the ways in which militaries and governments are seeking to establish that secrecy is by using the, um, the claim of psychosis each time a reporting victim or a witness of the illegal civilian use of this microwave weapon comes up. Psychosis, psychiatry, and uh, trying to dismiss the claims of reports and witness accounts is immediately put into play. So that brings us right back to political psychiatry, and it lays that right at the door of these governments. So you see, there's this huge cover-up, Governments are doing incredibly criminal things against populations, all in the interest of developing weapons for national security. Everybody is, you know, developing these weapons around the world. These are the new weapons of the new age. And therefore, we have to stay competitive. We are doing this, blah, blah, blah. And then, on the other hand, if anybody speaks out and says, I'm being hit with a weapon, off to the psychiatrist you go and straight into the psych ward. So... It comes back to what's something that we have talked about before. It is absolute nonsense. But in the name of national security, they are torturing people. Those are crimes against humanity. They cannot hide them under a psychiatry. They have to be called out. And it's time, you know, we called them out. Yeah, I, I think apparently they're looking uh, for an attack by women and children because these programs you were mentioning target women and children. So they, they want to research what's going on with women and children. That's, that's the bulk of the population in these programs. Yes. And it's for national security. So we must be expecting an invasion from Amazonia or something. And, I as, guess. and as many women have pointed out to me, Paul, how can it be experimentation when women are just being hit in the vagina nonstop? with these weapons. In other, in other words, they are experiencing rape and sexual assault with these weapons. Some women are, are experiencing this much more than others. So this is not any kind of legitimate experimentation. It cannot be legal. It cannot be condonable by anybody. You know? So it's obviously I think it's criminal. genocide. I think it's genocide, Kamala. I think you're right. If the UN had any if there were, if it was, if it was a moral organization that was trying to do something right, and they set up something called, uh, I don't know what it was, uh, the, the program, the the, uh, the area you said before. And I remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about. Uh, Catherine can remember. It was a torture czar. Is that was that his? Remember we we his name was. Uh, 
was it Snyder or Neil? Uh, oh, Nils Metzger, Remember him? the special rapporteur yeah. for torture. Yes, yes, torture. I'm writing yeah, a letter yeah. to him, sure. And I'm going to be publishing that letter soon as well. Yes. So he's the new special so, rapporteur for torture, and there is that, you know, that office in the UN. Yeah. But, but anyway, I think it's easy to show genocide if you're only attacking women and children. It seems to me. If I wanted to genocide a population, I'd, the hell with the men. I'd, I'd work on the Well, well they are hitting men, too. There are men as well in this program, you know, of a soul. There are men. But, but the yes, are you're women. right. The bulk are women. And they're hitting children, too. Exactly. And I think, Paul, you, are, you, you put your finger right on it. If you had a lot of time on your hands and your goal would be a total takedown of a society, you would want to kill off the next generation, that's children. You would want to cripple their children and you would want to um, uh, prevent um, procreation and you would prevent uh, women from conceiving and women, you would um, induce abortions in women. And I think that's exactly what we see in the victims. Um, women get their ovaries microwaved um, to damage the DNA of the offspring, the entire female line, in fact. You know, as Dr. Barry Trow said, um, the, eggs, um, the egg cells in a woman um, are formed by the time a, a girl is born. And um, if you damage those with Wi-Fi or with electromagnetic weapons, you damage the X chromosome, which means the entire female line, henceforth, of that particular person, an entire lineage. So if you wanted to do eugenics and genetic targeting, that's what you would do, and that's exactly what we see. I think you're totally right. And, and I think that's very different than it would look like if it was for national security. National security would look very different. This why, is genocide. A very, a very important question also to ask is, why do people in the CIA or the NSA or the DIA or what are the other, you know, secretive intelligence organizations that do all this DARPA, what, the DOD, why do these people need to hit a woman in the vagina a hundred times a day? For what reason? That is not experimentation. That is sadistic brutality. In addition to, as you say, genocide and eugenics, you know, trying to wipe out people's procreative and reproductive abilities, etc. But they're just hitting women in the vagina. That's sexual assault on and on and on. You know, there's no reason for it. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to talk to any general in the U.S. Army and ask him this question. What exactly is the reason for hitting a woman in the vagina 100 times a day? And, you know, if these are supposedly weapons testing operations, what exactly, what is the data that we are collecting from doing this? You know, it's, it's pointless. Basically, what they have done is they have created these programs. They've got these huge research contracts. They've got weapons testing contracts which are really nothing but money-making schemes, bilking money off the American taxpayer and engaging in massive statism, massive brutality. This is like uh, brutality under contract, you know, brutality that the American uh, taxpayer is paying for. The American taxpayer is essentially paying for electronic rape of victims, thousands of victims all around the U.S. And this is the same for every country. So again, it comes down to who is doing this. Well, clearly it's not just one intelligence agency or one country. They're all doing this. They're following the same protocol. That would make you suggest, make um, the, the suggestion that you have made before, Catherine, that this is one intelligence agency. This is one global operation. Seems to ring very true. You know, this is the new world order. This is the global government. This is the one world government. This is the one totalitarian fascist government that has set up these programs around the world. You know, this is the Khazarian Mafia. This is the Zion Nazi establishment. These are the Freemasons. These are the Satanists. Exactly. These are the Bilderbergers. These are the lunatics at the top of the pyramid who are doing. And you know what? As the list you just um, offered at the end is a very good one because you went from um, the, the one global intelligence agency intermorphed one agency, the one agency as I call it, um, you, you leapt from there to mafias, and um, that's exactly right, because, you know, you can use systems analysis, as I said before, you can use systems analysis to show that organized crime businesses 
which are just like any other business because they're money making schemes but they just don't pay tax they will make more money than any other business simply because the brakes are off you know the, the brakes of taxation so their profits rocket up compared to normal company so anybody who is in the business of organized crime will get much richer faster and therefore they can start buying police stations they can start buying intelligence agencies and that's what they do and when they do that over centuries what you'll end up with is exactly as you said the one agency a global one agency which is so intermorphed it is essentially one with organized crime which undergoes the same sort of process there's no regulator in organized crime therefore there are no monopoly monopoly regulations therefore you will end up with a monopoly in organized crime too and um, when you add one and one together, you realize there's only one intelligence agency, there's only one big organized crime cartel in the world that dominates it all, and the two are one and the same. Or they own, you know, organized crime owns the intelligence agencies. And suddenly it becomes all clear because, as you said, I am too also hit in the vagina. I have got chips in my genitals and my rectal area that I use, just like other victims, to torture me. Um, this is highly sophisticated um, and it's also interfaced with a signals network. I also have chips in my breasts, which I have filmed um, with this bug detector. By the way, I put the, um, the link to the bug detector we used into the chat. So if you just go to the chat, could you just copy and paste it into the live chat? Because I can't um, paste URLs, it blocks me. I've done it, I did see that. Oh, I did, I did okay. it a minute ago. Yeah. And um, you know, what we have is the chipping. You also pointed out in a previous episode that they found human trafficking victims who said, I'm chip. And the doctors, um, you know, to their amazement, found the body chips. And we are chip too. And that's not by mistake because we too, we are human trafficking victims. We are being sex trafficked. That's why we have chips in our genitals, because they most likely interface to, um, you know, the mobile phone of somebody who has paid a price to torture us. I think this is how it works. So we now have these intelligence agencies running global human trafficking operations, as systems analysis tells us. You know, that's why they don't investigate the pedophile rings. That's why they don't investigate the drug rings. And that's why they don't investigate the crimes against us, because we are being human trafficked by them. You know, I think yes. that's exactly Yes, it. absolutely. It is human trafficking and it is sex trafficking, as you say. Because literally, you know, if you look at the level of um, the logo, how people get targeted, how people get put on these lists, and how people get red flagged, as they say, you know, it's because of encounter at the local level with the local Freemasons or the local Satanists who work in the local covens, you know, I'm sorry, I'm using the word coven, but I guess what I mean is the local Freemasonic Guild or whatever, which is the I, old I think, club. I think yeah. what you mean is the local Freemason mob. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the local Freemason mob. And, you know, they think they're oh so powerful and they can get away with anything. And this is such a great scam because any woman who speaks out, any man who speaks out, they get put on a list. And once they put on the list, the, the, the machinery of the mob takes over, which is the local FBI, the local CIA, the local DHS, the local NSA. I'm talking about the U.S., of course, and I'm sure there are you know, equivalents in other countries around the world. They all come together because this is where the mob hangs out. They hang out in the secret agencies because they're cockroaches. They like to hang out, hang out under cover of secrecy. This exactly. is what they're all about. They're about secrecy. And this and is why we need to blow secrecy right out of the water. It's absolute crap. Because under cover of secrecy, they are tormenting, torturing, persecuting, raping, and enslaving women, children, and men. I think that's right. right. It, sorry, just I will pass it to you, Paul, because I was just about to refer to something you said, I think, in the last or second to last episode, Paul. You mentioned the, um, what is it called? Uh, the federal, it's not some, uh, what's it called? The federal police association, or what's it called? With all police um, officers in the U.S. are members of this police. Oh, the Royal... Uh, Fraternal Order of Police. Yes, exactly. They're Thank all you. members of it. They're all members of the fraternal fraternity, everybody. Fraternal um, Order of Police, yes. The mm -hmm. Well, um, I have, um, I've um, actually somebody did a very good um, expose of that, and they showed that even the, the logo of the federal or fraternal order of the police um, is a satanic symbol. So they are entirely interfaced with the Satanists. Um, it's in one of my um, recent tweets, so I'll dig it out and put it on, find the URL. 
That's exactly right. And in previous ex episodes, we exposed how the Freemasons are actually front by the mafia. You know, that's yeah. why. And I, you know, I had I had a strange thought. Let me interject this and let's see how strange you think it is. We did a video about, you know that the Super Bowl is the biggest sex trafficking day of the year. Probably second this year because we had the big sex trafficking thing in Rio de Janeiro. Or was it St. Paul where they did the, uh, they did the Olympics? Well, anyway, so we did a video and we showed that uh, the kids that were supposedly killed at Sandy Hook 13 months later were singing at the Super Bowl biggest sex trafficking day of the year why do you think they were doing there why do you think they were displayed there and they should go on that one but i was thinking while you two were talking you guys are you guys are being i think you guys are being sex trafficked right now it got you checked up and could it be could it be you're hooked into some video game somewhere or People, some some rich psychopath can pay a hundred thousand dollars to torture Ramola for, yes, for an hour or possible. a day. Entirely. I I think that's spot on um, because I have talked to um, several um, um, victims, and they um, one of the things that they reported is that they see their attackers. And some of them are high profile people. You know how people were called sky, so, um, they were fobbed off as schizophrenics if they ever reported that famous people stalked them. That used to be one of the diagnostic things. So somebody famous stalks you, oh, you must be mad. No, what it was is that these famous people had to, you know, integrate themselves into this satanic elite. Therefore, they had to show their Satanism and their criminal tendencies to get down, um, you know, get cozy with other psychopaths who would only trust them if they committed criminal acts. And they would pick women they fancied and they would stalk and torture them. Yes, exactly. So I have heard many, many victim reports, very credible ones, that famous people stalked them. Um, and I think that's exactly what it is. For the rich people, it's first of all voyeuristic fun that they pay for, but it's also their entry fee into the mafia. They pay the mafia and the mafia through the intelligence agencies then stages games. So I think Ramola also mentioned um, that um, you know she noticed this pattern of, of notable people or famous people crossing the victim's path. And because we all chip, they can tell exactly where we are. So when we're walking down the street, it's very easy to arrange for somebody to be able to cross our path at the right moment. Exactly. I Exactly. And I think also, Catherine, in terms of attempting to find, to uh, understand the motivations behind this lunacy, this particular form of lunacy, it seems to me that it's not merely that they are paying to torture women, I think, uh, which, they, which I think they are doing. But I think also what they are doing is they are gaining some kind of weird MK Ultra torture high from being in the presence of the MK Ultra torture victim. You see, that's why they cross your path. That's why they get on this queue, it seems, to be put on this AI queue, to, to be notified when you are taking X train to X spot, or you're, you know, you're going to be going to whichever location you're going to be going for the day. And they know our schedules, they know our routines, they hear our conversations, they bug everything, they know exactly what they're going to do next. So they get, on a they get on a train and they meet you in the middle of the train station, or they sit in the same train train cabin with you, or they get on the same tram or trolley that you're getting on, and they're sitting there right opposite you. I've had this experience. And they just stare at you and grin to themselves. Okay? Because they think they're doing something very sharp, very cunning, very covert, that nobody yeah. will know about, that they can never be caught for. Because exactly. they're so well hidden by this whole co cover of secrecy. This is like Wankers Incorporated. It's making me sick to my stomach to think about this. This is the most horrible thing I can imagine. And I'm sorry I imagined it. Well, as a matter of fact, um, Paul, if you go to my last article, which was my interview with Sherry Ganeri, you know, which was all about blowing um, retaliation, whistleblower retaliation for healthcare advocacy out of the water. Um, she was at, she was retaliated against because she spoke out about horrific uh, conditions in nursing homes in Massachusetts and Connecticut, 
and all of a sudden she, she writes to President Obama and all of a sudden she's got, uh, she's hit both physically with um, dues and she's hit with synthetic telepathy, which is V2K or voice to skull technology in her head. And then she's uh, hit with uh, visits from the Secret Service, asking her what she's, uh, what, uh, you know, telling her things that are absolutely outrageous. Basically, when she's hit with uh, synthetic telepathy, she writes again to President Obama saying, would you like to be hit with synthetic telepathy? Would you like voices in your head being rude and verbally aggressive to you? And immediately after that, the Secret Service comes and talks to her at her workplace and, and in her neighborhood and says to her things like, you were threatening the president. Well, actually, she was not threatening the president. She was reporting to the president that she was being hit with V2K and asking him how he would feel if he were hit with V2K. I think a perfectly legitimate question. I might very well have written that email myself, you know. So, but that is being deliberately interpreted by the Secret Service as you're threatening the president. In any case, after that, President Obama actually crossed her path several times at various places that she worked at. And that story is laid out in the interview. So, and he's not the only one who crossed her path. Um, she said she, uh, General Michael Hayden, showed up in a library in Massachusetts where she was, and um, a couple other people that she mentioned, you know, the head of the FBI, Louis Free, and so forth, who came to a restaurant that she used to work at. So, okay, yeah. so maybe, maybe she worked at these places which attracted that kind of clientele, or there was some deliberate crossing of paths there. I think I would go with the deliberate crossing of paths because General Michael Hayden, I don't think, needs to go to a public library. I think any sort of book he wants can be delivered mm -hmm. to his desk. In fact, it would be, you know, slight inconvenience for security uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, to be dragged to the local public library when that can be uh, arranged. You know, no, no, this is the crossing of paths. And I think the more I see of this, the more I think, um, all is right, we are part of some sort of computer game. And I think this is the gamification of abuse. Yes. So I think the mafia through the intelligence agencies has put on a game. You know how they made, what's it called? Oh, no, it escapes me. There's this computer game where you can, um, you can uh, photograph, you can go around with your camera, you know, through the streets and so on, and you can capture monsters. What's that called again? Uh, do you know the, the program? Oh, I, I remember when people were all Pac Man Go. Cliffs. Sorry? Pac Man Go. Is it Pac Man Go? No, it's not Pac Man Go. Yes, that's based on it, but it's a newer version. What's that called? Everybody. Everybody it's a hyper game. Yes, yes, po yes. Sorry. Po Pokemon Go. Pokemon. Yes, Pokemon Go. Yes, exactly. So, exactly. Pokemon Go. So, it's a gamification. Pokemon Go. Yes, and what people, what people do is that they go around with their phones filming everything and then occasionally, you know, a little uh, monster is then projected onto the, the um, video footage you can see and then it plays that you captured it. Way! And these people are so pleased and they literally go around their own homes catching monsters, they're going around other places. Guys, you know what this is? It's the gamification of intelligence work. The intelligence agencies got people to film the inside of their homes in greatest detail through gamification. And most people are freaking stupid enough to do it for them for free. You know, yeah, that's and it's, there's so many bad things about that game. You know, I think it's for somebody in the chat room said, uh, mentioned the term augmented reality. So it's all part of con converting reality into virtual reality, you know, moving people from existing in the world and smelling the, the flowers or whatever into existing inside this game, hyper game, and willingly give, giving their consent to becoming yeah. part of, you know, a hyper or a virtual reality. I, I agree, and I think that's that's. I think there are so many nefarious applications of that footage that people collect for um, the intelligence agencies through that game. That's unbelievable. But um, you know, we can explore that another time. But I think the same sort of gamification process is used to get rich people addicted to voyeurism. And this sort of game, live game of meet, meeting people they choose, and I suspect that they get some sort of brownie points. You know, yeah, some. So I'm sure. Yeah. I think it's it's used in some sort of game where that might turn into credit that they can then use for other things. It's like little tasks they have to do. They have to cross your path. They get you know aroused or whatever. You know, through the voyeuristic and the pouncing on somebody, a woman. You know, they doesn't like, expect it. So the more we see of this game, the more we can actually map out their system. But I'm pretty sure what this is, is actually the organized crime cartel trying to capture people and get them addicted through gamification. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and and because they're, they're being encouraged, people are being encouraged to see targets or test subjects as not human. You know, exactly. we are just completely dehumanized through these games, through this gamifying or gamification. Exactly, and I think whilst while this playing, because frankly, this playing, and I love, I love. Um, you know Paul's uh, suggestion that this is you know wankers Inc. Yes, that's a love. I love it. You know, it's the empire of wankers. Exactly. I guess what we should call it from now on. You know, it sounds so much more apposite than you know the yeah. elite. It's not the elite, right? So yeah. uh, it's it's a freak show. Yes, exactly. And that's another thing I would like to use, a freak show. What's a freaking freak show? Because um, they want to, you know, that's what psychopaths do. They present themselves as all so, so awe-inducing. And no, they're pathetic. They're freak it's show. The freak show of the global surveillance state. Watch out for an article shortly. Ex yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it, while, while this gaming and, and playing is going on, because, you, you know, I mean, we know that Justice Scalia was involved in something like that simply by the place where he died and, you know, at whose um, ranch he died and what was going on at that ranch. And, and you know, if a, if a Supreme Court judge is, is already in on these games, I mean, where, what has become of our public institutions? And while these people are literally wanking and playing, um, the mafia and this organized crime cartel is dismantling our um, institutions of state. That's mm -hmm. what's happening. And whilst everybody's uh, entertaining themselves, because this is the entertainment industry, you know, serious crimes are being committed and we are all being murdered. So I think the real key is to get back and force all the judges, all the police officers to do their job and also all the intelligence agencies. And just I, briefly, I, sorry. And I think part of that is actually publishing to the world and letting them know that we are going to publish to the world every time they fail to do their job, you know? Yeah. In other words, I'm sorry, but John Brennan, the guy who, you know, from the CIA in, in previous times, the head, who head of the uh, CIA during Obama's administration, and now Mike Pompeo, who's heading the CIA in Trump's administration, they are both culpable for running the programs that they are running. They know what's going on, right? Do you think the head of the CIA or the head, the director of national intelligence, what's his name, James Clapper, um, do you think they don't know or didn't know what's going on? No, they do know what's going on and they're part of the, the, the coterie that set it up. Absolutely, exactly. So they just have to be, you know, they, they have to be held culpable. And it's no use saying people reporting the use of uh, neuro weapons on their persons are actually just lunatic. They are just psychotic. They need psychiatry. It's no use saying that anymore. We have enough evidence at this point in time. To prove yeah. without a doubt we're so beyond that it's unbelievable yeah. I mean, now what we're actually honing in on is that exactly as you said um we can simply prove by now we have a critical mass of victims we can prove in every european country and every state of the us that this is a systematic program the fact that our chips you know here with me i was um you know chipped in europe you were chipped in the us the the pattern is exactly the same you know, Melanie in Belgium is exactly the same. Millicent is exactly the same. So this is a global program. And automatically, as soon as we have this evidence, we can um, automatically charge all heads of intelligence. Every single head of, you know, intelligence is already in the dock through that. This means Marco Seiler in Switzerland, Andrew Parker in, um, in Britain is guilty. And so is Gerhard um, Schindler, who was then um, superseded by Dr. Bruno Karl in Germany automatically in France. Unfortunately, I don't know the names of, um, you know, the intelligence heads in other European countries, but they are all guilty of crimes against humanity. And the same applies to all um, leaders of the intelligence agencies in the US. Mm -hmm. And I think we should also spell out what crimes against humanity. And that's what my notice drives to spell out. You know, they are guilty of crimes of rape, of sexual assault, of psychological assault, of electronic enslavement, of persecution and torture etc you know we need to spell out the exact crimes and also and this is the other thing about putting a notice um, of crimes against humanity out to the public is to let people know in your own neighborhoods and communities we have a right to watch you we have a right to film you we have a right to record you because you are engaging 
in aiding and abetting, you're participating in crimes against humanity. Crimes are my person. When you are helping the local mafia park in your driveway and use their little gizmos to track me and to hit me, as I'm sitting on my couch, you know, and all of a sudden I'm being hit all over my body, including my private parts, with incredible microwave pulses, that is a crime on my person. It's a crime of criminal trespass on my body. It's a crime of, um, you know, breaking and entering into my house. The radiation is entering in my, into my house non-consensually. Radiation is assaulting my body non-consensually and assaulting implants that are already non-consensually non implanted. So these are all crimes, and you as my neighbor permitting that is participating in this crime. And I have a right to report you. I have a right to record you and report you to the World Wide Web. I may yes. not have you know, any justice, any system, a code system right here to go to at this point in time, because you run them all. But I'm going to be building my own court system. Yes, and I think, you know what, this is very important to highlight to people, because um, when, um, when you're dealing with um, crimes of this gravity, a lot of offenses that um, might be punishable otherwise are totally reasonable as self-defense. And certainly, filming and photographing the faces of these criminals is everybody in fact it's not just allowed it's it's your duty because these people are assaulting not just you they're assaulting women and children it is your duty in a democracy to help us stop these criminals i would say it is the duty of everybody to to film these people when they're engaged in crime and to photograph their faces and to publish it and we, we can prove that the police refuse to investigate crimes and this means that the, the population at large, while, while the police is in deep capture, has to do it themselves. We have to stop this criminality. And we are dealing with a criminality that is virtually identical to the criminality in um, the Second World War. In fact, it's worse because now they are firing electromagnetic machine guns into your home through the walls, right? Um, when and the police are refusing to acknowledge that these weapons exist. That's yeah. the sort of the culminating irony. Exactly. In fact, you know, by the way, talking about the police, there's a couple of things I would like to um, reveal about the police. May I briefly share my screen? By the way, I have put into the um, chat um, the link when I talked about the um, this really good expose of the fraternal order of the police being satanic and having satanic symbolism. So I've just put the um, URL into this chat. If you could just copy to the um, to the main chat where I can't post the URL. And I'm just going to share my screen and I'm just going to show people. Um, so first of all, on my website, um, if you go to stop007.org, if you go to the FAQ, um, you can scroll down and you'll find a description of the bug detector that I'm talking about that is in all my videos that you can use to detect your body chips. That's for the people who asked about that with a detailed explanation of how to do it. And there are lots of videos, which I should link here as well, um, about what it looks like um, when you detect bugs. Um, then the second thing is, this is what I tweeted. Um, this is a, um, a video. Yeah, I tweeted it on the 16th of August. That's the link that Ramola just posted. That is um, the logo of the Fraternal Order of Police here. And what you can see is it's the, um, the pentagram, the five-pointed five star in a circle. Now, that's a satanic symbol. But that, it doesn't just stop there. I mean, first of all, it's a fraternal order of police. I mean, what happened to the, you know, the people who are women? You know, are they part of this fraternity? I'm not sure. And what you can see also is the all-seeing eye, right? That's the mafia symbol. But also the um, Freemasonic handshake, the funny handshake where you put your thumb on, you know, the knuckle. So that's so much about that. But the, um, you know, the video goes into much greater detail. Um, if I very briefly may, um, I would like to, if, if you guys um, allow me briefly, I would like to um, reveal something that was sent to me. It, it all fits into with what we're talking about. Um, after yeah, last, you, uh, Just one little interjection, just to be aware of the time. It's about 12.40 right now, Eastern time. We probably have 20 minutes more. Just, the only reason is because I have to cut out at 1 o'clock. Of course. So I'd have to, I guess I'd have to stop broadcast then at one o'clock. Is that what we're going to do? Yes, absolutely. It, it won't actually, hopefully it won't even take that long. I just wanted okay. to point out um, just two things, basically. No problem. Um, and, it, and it ties in. And um, 
basically what we're talking about is um, crimes against humanity are being committed by the intelligence agencies, the police is involved, in fact, they are at least aiding and abetting, if not actively driving it. Um, we mentioned all the problems with going to the police and then they refuse to even confirm that you submitted evidence, of course, because they know that if you submit evidence and they can be proven not to um, have acted on it in a court of law, they are directly um, liable. So we were talking about all this and this fits in with, you know, um, what we're saying about what happens if you go to the police. Now, I also talked about um, that I reported crimes against me to Greater Manchester Police when I um, was in Manchester and um, they refused to investigate. But then I had this very odd letter exchange with a certain Inspector Miskell. And in previous episodes, I went into great detail why I think that Inspector Miskell is a fake um, persona. It's an MI5 front. It's a cardboard cutout. I, was, I thought this person doesn't really exist. It's an MI5 character, not a real police officer. And I talked about this in greater detail with references to all the different things that happened. And what happens after last, um, last week's Techno Crime Fighters Forum, um, somebody um, sent me a link to a video that's meant to prove, as I understand, that this Inspector Miskell is real. And I would like to show that YouTube video of Inspector Miskell and I would like to explain what's actually wrong with it. So um, I'm going to post um, the link as well, but may, if I may just share my screen, um, by the way, Ramola, I'm just going to um, post, if you can post to the chat, the link to the video, I'm the YouTube video I'm going to talk about. Oh, sure, yeah. It's, hang on, it's this one. This is the link I was sent. Um, it's called um, The Inspector Comes to Call. And I'm just going to share my screen. And um, by the way, Ramola, could you switch off your microphone? Because if um, there's any background noise, it switches from the um, screen share. So, okay, people, this is the video I was sent, right? So, in this video called The Inspector Comes to Call, right? This is a video supposedly uploaded in May, May 18th, 2013, okay? And it said, Inspector Miskell of Greater Manchester Police watching his workforce assault me, all right? So, that's the video, and I thought, oh, that's very interesting. So, you watch the video, and it's filmed by some person who um, you know, is filming in front of his property, and then these are the police officers who come. And this guy here is, a, a, you know, is apparently Inspector Miskell, this guy here. So we now have a face for this guy, or so it seems at least. But as I was watching this video, I'm not gonna play it, it's seven minutes 37, you know, almost like, you know the Boeing 737? Hmm. Okay, so this is seven minutes 37 seconds long. And um, there are some very curious features about this because this video supposedly shows Inspector Miskell of Greater Manchester Police. However, when you um, watch the video, there are several things that are highly suspicious. So um, as the video kind of goes along at 1 minute 26 seconds, you can see Inspector Miskell's shoulder pads and you can see this, um, you know, this little rectangle star thing. Now that, if you go to um, Wikipedia, that's what you see is this symbol here, this image, okay? Um, oops, I can't make it bigger. I hope you can see. Um, so th this double star is the rank of inspector, okay? So the rank of inspector, this one. Um, a police constable just has his serial number, a sergeant has his number plus these three wings, and an inspector has this double star. And in the video here, what you can see is one of his stars, all right? And he's called Inspector Miskell. Okay, so at least the shoulder pads match up with the title. But what's wrong? Well, you can also see that he's holding a notepad. Imagine he's holding a notepad where it's written Inspector S. Miskell. In case you were wondering if it is some other Miskell, no, this is S. Miskell, Inspector S. Miskell. How convenient that he would be carrying a notepad that where the writing of his own name on his notepad is big enough that on the video it shows up perfectly, really legibly, you know? How, what coincidence? Okay, but it gets better than that because in case you didn't know when this was recorded, you can see Inspector Miskell's mug, his Inspector um, shoulder pads, Inspector S. Miskell, and even the year, it's 2013, right? As it also shows on the YouTube video. 
2013. What could possibly be wrong with this video? Well, what's wrong with this is if this was uploaded in May 2013, six months later, the Manchester Evening News reported about um, the death, as I mentioned to you, the death of Tracy Miskell. Yes, PC Tracy Miskell was found dead just minutes after returning home from the gym with husband Stephen, right? Stephen Miskell, S. Miskell. Now, this article was published in September 2013, right? May 2013, Inspector Miskell is there, you know, being called out. A couple of months later, in September, the greater, uh, sorry, the Manchester Evening News reports about the death of his um, partner, or his wife even, who just dropped dead when they came back from the gym, just like that. You know, that's Tracy Miskell, who apparently dropped dead, but then, if you read the article, it says PC Miskell, that's Tracy Miskell, and her husband, a sergeant, were close friends of two other people who died. Hang on. In September, Stephen Miskell is a sergeant. But a couple of months earlier, he was already inspector. So let's go back to the ranks. So in May, Inspector Miskell is an inspector. In September, he has been downgraded to a sergeant? I don't think so. What's going on? Right? But that's what you see in the video. S. Miskell, inspector written there, you know, inspector on the shoulder pads, quite clearly, inspector on the shoulder pads here. And that was the crunched up shoulder pad that we just saw previously. Hmm. This doesn't make any sense. And the fact that his notepad just shows it so very clearly, you know, all the cornerstones that you would possibly want to know, is this really Inspector S. Miskell? Is written here. And the year, it's written there. And he's an inspector, see? Everything's fine. Move along, citizen. Well, but there are some other problems, because in this video, you can also see the street sign 6th Avenue, and then this really funny blurring that looks a bit like Photoshopping. And then what you can do is you can go to Google um, Street View. So you can go to Google Maps and try to find all the six avenues in Greater Manchester Police. And I found three. I found one in, um, I think, in Oldham. I found one in uh, Bury. And there was a third one. Um, and when you go to um, Google um, Street View and you walk up and down those streets, those streets look nothing like 6th Avenue in this video, like nothing. And then, you know, you can scan through the video and, and bit by bit, you'll see bits and pieces. You can see, for example, the shape of the door, the color of the door, the shape of this sideband, the windows and so on. Again, Inspector Miskell, supposedly. But I would say that this 6th Avenue, unless there's a fourth 6th Avenue in Manchester that I haven't found through Google Maps, I would say that this entire video is fake. And 6th Avenue, as it has been displayed here, doesn't actually exist. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist. And if this video is fake, it would explain why 6th Avenue doesn't exist on Google Street View. It would explain how an inspector, supposedly who's an inspector in May, becomes a sergeant by September. Okay? So that's all nonsense. Um, and then you can also see a second person here in this video, uh, literally at four seconds. That's supposedly the other person. Now here you can see this kind of wings, right? So remember on Wikipedia, the wings were the sergeant sign, yes? Here you can see the wings and then above that the number, the serial number of this officer. And I think somewhere in the video you can actually pick out the exact serial number. People should check if this person exists because I wager he does not. And what's very strange is he has this, he is only shown once, but then he has this really funny way of holding his hand in his vest. Maybe police officers find it convenient to, to stuff their hand in there. But- no, that, um, Catherine, Catherine, that's a Freemason sign. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what I thought. Because you know how Napoleon held it in front of his stomach in his jacket and there's like other, you know, um, U.S. presidents with exactly the same gesture being uh, members of the Freemasons. Exactly. I thought that's a Freemason sign. So that those dudes, or that dude certainly, is a Freemason, and this entire video is just total garbage from start to end. It's a fake. 
right? It has been just I'm drawn up, but there's more details because also by the same person who, you know, strangely is called, uh, it says Doobie 8576, which a bit sounds like Dobby, you know, the little um, gnome in Harry Potter who does all the services for his master, who is this evil bastard. Well, Dobby, right? Dobby8576 um, makes these videos. And there's a second video where you can see again, Sixth Avenue and another police officer. And people should go through because to me, it looks like the impersonation of police officers. But the bottom line is that what we seem to have here is that I complained about Inspector Miskell not being real and then MI5 making a little video kind of trying to convince me that Inspector Miskell in fact exists. However, I don't actually think that MI5 are quite that stupid. So I think what this actually is, it's just what we talked about again. This is gaming. This is gamification. You know, MI5 must have been like, Chris, Chris, can you just please make this fake video? But it has to look as shit that you can possibly make it. Why do I need to do that? Well, just because, you know, it's for national security. So they put on this farce, right? They photoshopped this. They got the actors. They get the police uniform. They put on this farce, you know, they photoshop Sixth Avenue and so on. And that's what they do with your taxpayer money. For what? What the flying finch is the point in all this? It's not national freaking security, right? They just proved that Inspector Miskell is an MI5 front. But we knew that, okay? So what's the point? This is a game. And somebody in MI5 or somebody in the British establishment is basically getting kicks out of me running around playing Sherlock Holmes and debunking their weaponized nonsense. But what's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it is that in the background, women are being tortured to death, children are being mutilated and murdered, and these people are wanking. That's what it is. You know, on business time, you know, during office hours. So and that's what it is. They're in the business of acting, as we know, with all of these false flag events all around the world, the false flag terror with the crisis actors, crisissolutions.com, you know, bellpottinger.com, et cetera. All of these companies that farm out actors, Hollywood actors, named as crisis actors to show up in the videos of the next terror event, the next shooting event. Exactly, exactly. And how intelligence agencies are connected with that, you know? Exactly. And, and that's exactly it. I mean, uh, you know, one day we'll talk about the connection of the intelligence agencies to the media in much greater detail. But I'm, I'm so glad you pointed it out. And I, I, again, float this idea that we should have the Oscars, you know, for crisis actors, you know? It's like a category in the Oscars, you know, the Oscar for the best crisis actor in this year's terrorist events goes to, you know, and it picks yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. I think there's somebody who does put out something like the crisis actor. Oscars, but I don't think it's going to be with the, you know, the other <laughs> Oscars. <laughs> it should be. Right. I think they hire them based on the fact that they can't act. I think they want to just be so transparent. The actors are so bad. Remember that video I passed That's around true. about that guy? He was actually a legitimately good actor. He was. And he was shown next to, oh, the, the crying guy at Sandy Hook and uh, Mm -hmm. You know, I think they hire them based on the fact that they don't have any talent and they're yeah. so not memorable. Exactly. And you know what? Again, we're back to the entertainment industry. And the question is, while well, everybody, including these so-called elites, are entertaining themselves, what's really going on? And I know I've got four minutes from all. And the last four minutes, I would like to just briefly dive down the rabbit hole as a taster for people, for all the investigators. And I would like to show something which is, um, so a, couple, a while back, hang on, let me find the browser tab. Yes. So I think in the last episode at the last um, Techno Crime Fighters or the one before, I, I um, talked about the City of London boundary dragons and the importance of the City of London. So a quick refresher, while you have um, Greater London, there's also something called the City of London, that what's also called the Square Mile, and that's a territory inside London, a tiny, tiny territory here in Greater London. And um, that's the ancient territory of London. You know, when the Romans, as in the Italians, you know, with links to the mafia, came to Britain and the Romans set up camp, they had here, you know, London or whatever they called it in those days. 
um, and they fortified it. And I, I would put it to you that they are still there and they're still owning this territory. So this is the old London, but the old London has these boundary dragons. It has 10 of them at the old major entry points into the city of London, which used to have, um, you know, um, a city wall. And I think these dragons are placed at the old gates. Now, I also placed the, um, the quiz question. Um, I said, all these boundary dragons are photographed, you know, and there's a list, there's a 10 dragons like that. And I said, as a homework investigators, please go away, look at all these dragons and tell me which one is the odd one out. I said there are two which are um, odd. So one is the very last one here in the list. Sorry, they all look identical. So they all look kind of like whitish silver with this um, red um, marked wings. But there's one um, in front of the Royal Courts of Justice, which looks totally different and really scary. So that's clearly an odd one out. But I said, in this list, find the other dragon that's also the odd one out. You know, one amongst the ones which are the silver style here, you know. And I said, go through and try to spot the differences. And now I would like to um, solve this puzzle. So anybody who um, hasn't actually done this exercise, please stop the video now and try to find it and then watch the end of the video later. And I'll solve this now. And the, the dragon I meant, um, I want you to look at the tails of this dragon, okay? It's white. So the dragons have these red tongs, um, a red um, highlighting, a red cross under the wings, and then, of course, the shield, okay? But the dragon itself has just a red tongue on this one. And then the, the wings, again, you know, red tongue, but white tail. Um, again, red tongue, white tail, and so on, red tongue, white, white tail. But then when you go down, again, red tongue, white, white tail, you keep going down, and eventually you go to one that's at Bishop's Gate, and it's red tongue, red tail. Huh. And what's really strange is, you know, the tongue is pointing outward, and it looks like, it looks like a little arrow, doesn't it? So all these tongs pointing outward are red, you know, scary dragon tongue pointing outward. But there's one tail that's also red, and it also looks like an arrow. So this arrow is pointing backwards into the city of London, and it's highlighted. And this is at Bishop's Gate, as in the gate of the bishop. Yes, the bishop, something to do with the Vatican. Yes, Bishop's Gate dragon has a highlight. Now, if you don't believe me, you can go to um, Street View. Hang on, I've got things. Sorry, um, this one. This is the dragon that's photographed, and you can see this is at the building two hundred one Bishop's Gate, um, the Broadgate Tower. And in front of the Broadgate Tower, you have this dragon, and you can see here the red arrow. Now, this arrow seems to be pointing up. So there could be something if you go up this high rise up in the Broadgate Tower. Who knows? There could be something there, but because all the dragons have this sort of tail, I, I'm, I'm led to believe that the curvature of the tail is not it. But what is it is the direction this arrow is pointing in. And when I look down the street where this dragon is here on Google Street View, I hope you can see this. It's this street. And when I look into the distance, what do I see? A big phallic symbol. It's called the Gherkin. It's like a special building in London that has been built in the shape of a phallus. And it just so happens that the highlighted arrow at the dragon's tail is pointing at a massive phallic symbol at the heart of the city of London. How um, did I get away with this? Oh my goodness. Well, yeah, you know, if I, exactly. If I now get out of street view, let me zoom out and let me show you where this is, okay? So this is this tall building. The dragon is this little shadow here, and it's pointing down. It's called Worship Street. It's pointing down Worship Street. So you have to worship what? The big, massive phallus, which is if uh, you show it, she, see it in the distance. Hang on, let me zoom out, and then you can see it. So where is, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I understand what happened. Sorry, it's not actually Worship Street. Worship Street is a parallel street. Forgive me, forgive me, it's not. The dragon is down here, it's pointing down. So when I zoomed out, um, north was um, pointed back up. And when you go down, you end up at this building complex here. And um, the gherkin is, hang on, uh, this one here. That's the gherkin, that's what you can see. That's this 
building, okay, the gherkin. So when you, what you could see is the little dragon is here, and when you look straight down, it's actually, that's what you see in the distance through the gaps in the houses, okay? So you can, you can do this test yourself and you can convince yourself, but that's what you see. So we are now at the heart of the city of London, and yes, remind about the time. We're at time, yeah. actually. Exactly. So I will. I'll just finish off because um, the next homework is to um, to go away and um, for people and to watch the following. Sorry, it's not Bill Binney. Where's the video? Let me find it. Uh, this one. I want investigators to go away and um, watch the video by David Ike. Um, David Icke is giving a tour around London City, <laughs> Babylon Don, okay? That's what he called it, like the city of Babylon. Um, and at um, 13 minutes um, or 14 minutes, he's talking about another landmark in the city of London, which is Mansion House. And he goes on about ritual sacrifice happening at Mansion House. Now, I want people to go away, listen to David Icke, you know, it's like half an hour report, and then figure out um, what the connection is between the Gherkin, all the City of London dragons, and Mansion House and other landmarks. Brilliant. Yeah, it's fascinating. And you know, Catherine, we really should do that video together, do a sort of a focused podcast on the dragons, maybe this weekend. Let's just take the time. Okay. We can. We can put the solution on, on the dragons, but that's the homework because it all leads it leads somewhere. Don't just do it for laughs. This is this is serious investigation here. And next week there will be more about the city of London. Let me let me throw this at you before you leave. I think that Lita and the Swan, I think the Swan was a dragon. I think that's how the reptilian line got into the royal family. And I think that's the lineage of all English people. So if you just replace the swan, which is an innocent loving mm -hmm. creature with these dragons, I think you get a more accurate depiction. Oh, and another thing, I think the phallic signal, symbol, it also looked like a pine cone to me because it goes in at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So just a couple things for your video. Yeah, very interesting. To think about. So what's the what's because your channel is called Pinecone Utopia. So what's the meaning of the pinecone? Does it have some symbol symbol meaning? Oh yeah, if you look at pinecone, it's it's the pineal gland. It's the thing in the middle of your head, and uh, supposedly it connects you with your uh, universe or something. It connects uh, you with your higher self. I was sort of blanked out here on the audio. So, so that's what pinecone utopia is about, going into the pineal gland. If you find any sculpture of the Buddha, he's always got a pinecone on his head. It's, a, it's kind of a universal symbol for that. Anyway. This is an interesting aside. I live on Pine Street. In wow. <laughs> there are no coincidences. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. Yeah. Well, I kind of have to take off at this point, so I'm wondering, so I guess we just stop the broadcast at this point? How shall I do it? I, I think, I think, yeah, you, you just you just hit the off button. We'll sign off. We say goodbye. Thank you for listening. And next week, there will be more mysteries. And this was just a quick taster. Next week, we'll really dive down the rabbit hole. Yes, and wonderful. And hopefully next time, you know, I will have my notice fully ready. It will be posted on my website, and I'm going to ask everybody in the world to take that notice of crimes against humanity and slap it everywhere on every telephone pole, hand it out to people at the metro, the local tube, whatever, you know, put it online on your website, do it because we need to send a message to everybody who is doing this to innocent citizens around the world that they're on notice, they're being watched and they're going to be held culpable. They're going to be held accountable because these are crimes against humanity. Paul, did you want to say anything to say goodbye? Well, uh, I, mean, I did have, I had something in my mind, but I kind of left it go. I thought that this um, episode, starting at about half hour in, got really delightfully interesting. And I hope that there are people in the, in the web that pull this thing apart because uh, these, 
two women have said things that are really, really should be rocking the world right now on this podcast. So that's, I thought it was a great podcast. Thank you. I think we got on fire there for a minute too. Yes. We have to top it next week. So stay tuned and see you next week. <laughs> yes, everyone. See That's you next right. week. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.